for us, and this is uh, Pavel Nimic. Yeah, yeah there right. we go. Cool, close. Um, he's our senior data engineer in the Belfast team. Um, firstly, thank you very much for coming to the talk. Very aware that you had three choices, and we're grateful that you came to hear us. So hopefully in the next 25 minutes or so, you're going to hear some interesting stuff uh, and take something away. Um, over the next 25 minutes, we're going to explain why we as a team chose you down the route of implementing a graph data store. Um, from a data modeling perspective, as well as investigating some of the technical capabilities. Pavel's going to say all the technical words. I'm going to do some of the business type stuff. Um, so before we kick off, let me take three minutes to explain to you the problem that our team is trying to solve. And the best way to do that is to start with a story. So two years ago, uh, there was an engineer in a large corporation uh, working on uploading their Oracle data store. He realized that it was the only application running on that server, and that he could save his company money by moving it into their virtualized environment. He built it, job done, great stuff. But um, Oracle then came along and audited the firm and issued the firm with a huge uh, million and millions of dollars when they came across that one instance. So the problem was that Oracle's license terms are on a per processor basis. Not the number of processors being used by their software, but the number of processors available to, to the software. And since this database was now running in a virtualized environment, hundreds of processors, they were now in gross violation of their terms. But the truth is that most large organizations, even most large um, medium-sized organizations, have no idea what they're running in their infrastructure, software or hardware. Maybe they've got so much of it, with so many people managing it, and um, they just uh, can't keep track of what's there. Or they just aren't good at managing assets in a um, consistent, manner, uh, consistent manner. So we as a company um, supply these types of organizations with data about enterprise hardware and software. And we also provide some tools to help the, the organizations normalize their own asset data so that they know exactly what they have in their architectures. In other words, we provide a catalog of enterprise IT devices um, and software. We provide means to link those, um, link the company's assets to that catalog. And that facilitates procurement, audit preparation, and license management. So if you want to know which of your servers have the highest um, power pulling potential, then we can help you with that. If you want to know uh, what percentage of your software state is going to be compatible with Windows 10 whenever you want to upgrade your 10,000 employees, then we can help with that too. In over 15 years, we've made the lives of many enterprise architects, planners, and asset managers better. However, our team was put in place last year, just uh, about nine months ago, with um, I Am The Future. Every industry suffers the same kinds of problems that we're, we've seen in enterprise IT. Think about the medical industry. Or, the, or heavy industries, or IoT. What are all the things? When will they end of life? How much power do they consume, and what are they compatible with? Our goal is to become the standard for data about all connected assets, be it a Dell server, or a Cisco network switch, um, a Sigfox radio, or even a DPS guidance system for a self-driving combine harvester. And to achieve that, um, our team has been completely rebuilding the company's catalog called Technopedia. Um, it's cloud-based microservices architecture, and now nervous after hearing Paddy's talk for uh, whoever was in here previously. Um, we're using great programming languages, Golang, Python, React, and we've even created our own query language. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover most of this, but please do hit up with us afterwards. We'll be out in the speaker space um, if you want to come and talk to us about any of the other good stuff. So in building our catalog, um, we developed our own taxonomy for our hard hardware and software. Um, this taxonomy was directly translated into a relational database schema. In other words, we have tables for products, vendors, um, releases, versions, and so on. And then we can find foreign keys between those tables to try and describe the relationships um, between those entities, between those records. However, in our next version of Technopedia, we need to store the content for devices from a much uh, wider range of industries. And therefore, the Technopedia taxonomy is simply exploding in terms of complexity. Furthermore, um, while we were confident that our team could scale the technology and put a great team in place and um, great experience, um, we were actually very aware that um, scaling the business was going to be a bit of a problem for us. How do we get all that content? for IoT, for example. 
Um, so our new platform needs to facilitate a whole new range of challenge uh, channels for acquiring content, not just data entry from our own researchers, but from a whole range of new people, our users, our customers, um, even just the general tech community um, giving us data. And as you might expect, no two customers will agree on what the correct taxonomy for software and hardware is, and therefore we want to provide our customers with a way to add their own private concept um, to that content. Thank you. As Phil mentioned, our schema is already complex. Adding to the schema is almost uh, impossible. Updating is not is a nightmare. We just try to add the tables, try to new columns, but it even gets more complicated. Um, whenever you want to query such schema, it's not an easy task. It's only a simple query against it. And uh, I chose it because it was one of the few which would fit on this slide. <laughs> it basically gives me a sorted tax of associated object within given taxonomy, whatever it means. It's creating such schema is, uh, such queries is hard. Updating is even worse. And especially if you need to integrate those with our customers on-prem solutions. Even though the quality of our gr data is great, our customer support need to deal with all that difficulties. They need to discover connections, firewalls, configurations, before they can even start building the queries. And in summary, it's really, really hard and long process. They're doing a great job uh, and helping all our customers and bringing new customers on board. But for every new on-prem customers, we need to do a full data load. And I assure you, it takes a bit longer than that. We currently have over 120 million data points to load, and due all of those reasons like complex queries, data size, integration issues, our performance is not what we would like it to be. Phil's going to explain in detail why. So relational databases um, are commonly used um, for managing contextual data. In fact, they're used in pretty much every company on the planet. We sell the data into meaningful groups that we call tables, and then we define the relationships between those tables, which gives us a structure which we call the schema. The schema is our framework for our ability to define the content. Now, these tools are okay for this. As long as you know exactly what question um, you want to ask of that, um, of that uh, schema. Um, in other words, the schema is designed up front to answer, uh, to specifically assess and to answer specific questions. But the moment you need to ask a new question or capture a new piece of data, the schema is then redundant. And uh, you have to up update the schema to uh, retain the quality of your information. So here, I'm just trying to add a new record for a TikTok procedure. But I my new different schema doesn't have the sensitivity field I need. Database schemas come with a world of pain due to the need uh, to maintain the state of the data in your data store array. It's not just a matter of updating the metadata. Now, before we go any further, um, Pablo and I have spent 10, 11 years each uh, working with relational data stores, SQL. Uh, personally, for me, SQL is still my favorite language. I, I love coding it, so we're not taking up SQL. But what we want to do uh, is establish why we moved away from this um, paradigm for our platform. Um, they're great for managing context, but they're actually very, very clumsy at handling relationships. There's something of a naming problem with the technology. So the, um, part, the relational part of the name doesn't actually refer to relationships whatsoever. It actually refers to the logical groupings of tuples and um, attributes and elements, elements within those tuples. And that's just a really verbose way of saying a table. So when we talk about relational databases, we're talking about databases that store data in tables. And that's fundamentally the most important feature of these technologies. And when it comes to relationships, yes, we can define foreign fields between tables, um, saying that you know, data in column A of field B must match some data in col column C of table B. But um, in this kind of um, system, relationships are actually defined as second class citizen. They're actually just constraints, given the illusion that the two tables are some way, in some way related. There's different types of relationships, the one-to-one, -one, where one record in one table must match one record in another table, and relational databases love this. It's their bread and butter. With indexes in both columns, um, any query you fire against that is most likely going to run very fast. 
Let's simply one to many, where one record in one table matches one or more records in another. And again, with properly defined indexes, partitions, etc., you create a probably going to be okay. The problem comes with our last one, the many to many relationship, where one or more records in one table must match one or more records in another table. And the problem is uh, that in any real world application, it isn't meaningful to define a direct relationship between these two tables, unless in the very unlikely event that. Um, got a direct correlation between the common values for matching records, in which case it's much more likely that you've got a problem and that you've got duplicated data rows or that you're just doing very bad data based design. It's much more likely that the handle of possible variations of attributes in those relationships that you're going to have to define a mapping table and I'm pretty sure that if you've worked with relational databases and any kind of catalog or system you'll be familiar with these. Um, there's, several pro there's several problems. Additional joins means more exper expensive query time, and this can be a killer, especially if you've got um, a large query or you're querying a large data set or both. You've got additional expense on insert. <coughs> the need for additional foreign keys means more constraints, and therefore every data row you enter, you don't have to do the engine pass to validate the data you're entering, but you're filing any of those constraints. And lastly, your, your scope for error is multiplied by several times because we have to write to multiple tables. And all of that said, these types of models are still extremely common. So I have used the word context several times already, so I want to spend a very short time talking about why that's important to us. So you can have a piece of data, like um, I went to the coffee shop earlier and I got my coffee cup, it's got my name and also a little smiley on it, so you know, I'm sure about what that means. Um, but without any context, I don't actually have any, any information. So if I try and act on this, if I try and make a decision on what this means, whenever I try to handle this by the barista, um, I'm actually likely to make a bad decision. What is context? So context is derived by looking holistically at all the available data, identifying groupings or clusters of related data points, and that enables us to defend meaning on any individual data point. So if I know that the barista has put the smiley next to everybody's name on everybody's cup, then I get the insight into the meaning of the smiley on my own table cup, and therefore I need to make a different decision. So data doesn't tell us anything, but if we take the data and add context to the data, then we get information. If we take our information, add more context, then we get knowledge. And when you're building a catalog like we are, it's the knowledge that is all important, and that's why context is so important for us. I want to try to demonstrate this in a way. So uh, I'm going to show you two different pictures. Uh, so this is audience participation time. Yay. Um, so I'm going to show you a picture, and can, some, can someone, can, can anybody tell me what you can see on that screen? Can anybody see anything else? Does anyone say person? Okay, you might be wrong or short sighted. Um, I'm going to do. I'm going to show the same picture again, and all I'm going to do is reduce it in size. I'm not altering it in any way. I'm just shrinking it, and I'm hoping and praying this works because this screen is enormous. Um, this wasn't planned, so I'm working by feel. Can anyone see it up in north? A person. Okay, let's try a different one. This one's brighter. <laughs> what about now? Okay, so what's going on? Um, these are actually called hybrid images. They're created by taking um, two copies of the same picture, um, making one very uh, have a very high spatial frequency and the other one's a very low spatial frequency. All that means is how many data points there are in any given unit of space. And the thing is that our eyes detect different amounts of data at different distances. So the closer you get to an image, the more data you see, and therefore the picture can appear to change. In the same kind of way, our catalog is going to store data at different spatial frequencies. So you think about any type IP server switches, etc. They're going to have a very different spatial frequency, if you like, to compared to sync box receivers. Um, and if we try to store all of that data at the same spatial frequency in the same schema, fixed schema, if you like, then when you look at the picture, the picture. Um, at least one of the images that you might be seeing is going to be either missing or at best incomplete. So we found our solution in graph theory. Instead of modeling our data in tables or columns, we model the data as nodes with attributes. We can define a range of node types, each with a different set of attributes. And that gives us the flexibility to introduce new types of things extremely easily. 
But the real power is in how it wraps up the problem of complex relationships. Graph allows for the creation of relationships between nodes, kind of like between tables, but the difference is that graph relationships are elevated to first class citizens. Each relationship type can have its own set of um, <coughs> attributes, and therefore graphs are exceptionally good at defining why nodes are related, not just in amplifying that they are. It's actually a much more natural or human way of representing the data. And you can see on the screen that I've been able to very easily um, add my nodes for a um, single class procedure. And I can now identify a new relationship type which is compatible with. I now have new information, new knowledge that um, different things are in some way created. Yeah. But you need to implement it somehow. Apache Tinkerpop has been uh, created with its version 3, has become the, the de facto standard for graph databases. <laughs> it is a computing framework consisting of multiple systems, among which Titan is the one of the most important ones. It is a scalable graph database engine. And in relational world, we use SQL to query uh, data. There were attempts to use SQL to query graph databases, but all of them failed. So uh, this is where Gremlin appeared. It is a traversal language created specifically for graph data queries. Traversal means that you start with a node or edge or sets of them, and you, by using a steps, you just traverse over the graph. Here's a very simple example of a gremlin query. You can, can be read as G for the current graph, V for the vertices in this graph, and has name Hercules, filters the vertices down to those only with Hercules in the property name. And for this data set, there's only one such vertex. Then you have out father, which traverse outgoing edge of father from Hercules to Ju Jupiter. And again, it's going from Jupiter to Sat Saturn. Uh, value name gives you the uh, name of the uh, ending vertex, which is the Saturn. You can also go, go back and uh, by using incoming father edge from Saturn vertex and list all his sons. So do you remember the SQL query I gave you? T to give me the sorted tax of all associated objects within the taxonomy. It's pretty intuitive, isn't it? For highly connected data, with where the relationships are very, very important, as important as the data itself, it's very, very easy to cr create such queries. But to have those queries returning those data quickly, we need to have a store data in a particular way. Um, you can't really store it in a single file, especially when you grow. So uh, there is a... Uh, Storage has to have certain uh, uh, characteristics. It has to be fast. Uh, well, which one doesn't have to? Read optimi uh, optimized for our workload, we need it uh, to read fast. We need to be able to scale to uh, accommodate our growth, and we need to be able to replicate it in, into multiple data centers. Um, it's for uh, resilience and for geographical uh, dispersion. Titan has been built to support various storage options. Uh, one of them is HBase, another one is Berkeley, and yet another is Cassandra. All of them have different characteristics. Uh, I tried to explain them, but I need to introduce the cap theorem. In the distributed world, AC does not apply. It has to be replaced by cap theorem. It says that it is impossible to, for a distributed data store to provide more than two out of those three uh, guarantees at the same time. Those are consistency, availability, and partitioning, which is scaling. As you can see, HBase is on the CP side, Berkeley is on CA side, and Cassandra on AP side. For our use case, we need a scalability for fast growth and connections around the world, and availability for connections around the world, and 100% uptime. 
It does not mean we don't want our data to be consistent. It means that we can wait a short period of time for this data to become consistent. Cassandra has been built with this approach, which allowed the implementation of certain characteristics. Now I'm going to explain some of them. First is a cluster layout. In a Cassandra, it is a ring, where subsequent data, shards, data partitions, are stored sequentially clockwise on the servers. In the distributed world, it seems like a good idea to partition data and put it on different servers. But this allows you to create a peer-to-peer -peer archi architecture, so there is no master, no failovers, no leader election latencies, or you can contact any server and it will serve you as a coordinator. Uh, data partitioning and peer-to-peer -peer architecture allows linear growth of the cluster. It means that whenever you double the number of servers, you can handle twice as many requests as uh, previously. This chart has been published by Netflix and they have one of the biggest uh, Cassandra cluster in the world. So you can see it's linear. But when you have hundreds of servers, it is possible that some of them will fail. So uh, what happens if we lose a server? Cassandra has a concept of replication. And by default, the replication factor of three. So you take a one partition and put it on three different servers. This parameter is tunable uh, at the uh, key space creation or during the write process. You may ask, why three, not two? Imagine that you're doing maintenance or upgrade to your system, and one of the uh, other servers fails. If you have replication of two, you're, you're down. You're, you're not serving data, so there's no 100% availability. With replication factor of three, there's still at least one server which can give you that data. Um, there's also a really, really uh, interesting ability whenever you query that data and coordinator asks uh, one of the, all, all the servers for, for data, uh, the fastest uh, server can reply. So you're not relying on only one busy server in, in there. And, but whenever you have multiple uh, data on different servers, you need to think about consistency. Then here we back. There are a wide variety of consistency models out there. There's a strong consistency, causal, weak, eventual, different models. The trade-off in each is between the speed of write and the time it gets consistent. Uh, Cassandra uses eventual consistency, which guarantees that if no new updates are made to the given data, eventually all of the servers will serve the same last updated data. To support that, Cassandra has introduced read and write consistency levels. Imagine a client connects to a cluster to read or write data. Each time the client can choose the consistency level of the operation, but it only affects how this particular request is seen from the client side. So client connects to coordinator, which contacts relevant servers, the ones which contains the data in the question. With consistency level of one, only the fastest server has to provide the data when reading or acknowledges the write. Uh, when the client, the, the downside of this is the client does not know if the actual fastest server has the most up-to-date data. Uh, that's for read and for write, client does not know if the other two server has got those data. But given that Cassandra has a good uh, replication uh, capabilities, you can eventually say that it's, it's there. So for, for this reason, consistency level of quorum has been introduced, which is half of the uh, replication factor plus one. In this case, it's two. Uh, so for write, whenever two servers uh, gets back to the coordinator saying, okay, I got the data, then uh, it acknowledges back to client. For the read operation, things get a bit more complicated. Coordinator receives checksums from two servers and compares them. If they're matches, they take one of the data and gets back to client. If not, it takes the most up-to-date one. So uh, 
the last write wins. This is the whole concept of Cassandra. You need to keep in mind whenever you model the data. There's also uh, consistency level of three, but in distributed world, it just gives all the pains. So you have, uh, uh, you need to wait for all three servers to acknowledge the write, and you need to get back uh, checksums from all three servers and resolve conflicts uh, in this case, which takes time, uh, brings the uh, uh, our performance down. Not a good idea. Um, Tuning consistency level gives your application ability to trade off between uh, speed and consistency. However, it introduces uh, data entropy. There are various uh, mechanisms uh, to fix that, like periodic uh, read uh, repair jobs, read repair chance, and other means. There are quite a few of those, uh, different, different topic on this. Uh, the most recommended approach, like I said, is uh, uh, read quorum, read quorum, uh, write quorum consistency levels as a good balance for most of the use cases. However, it doesn't mean no other options are uh, possible. For, for example, for read uh, heavy write uh, workloads, you can have a write all read one approach, which means your reads will be very quick. For uh, read uh, heavy workloads, get the write one, read all approach, and that will give you uh, the very, very high speed of writes. Um, there's also one, uh, one uh, read one and write one uh, approach, but it's not recommended. It's effectively uh, doing the same thing as you would have one server, but if you have one server, you're not scaling. Um, so, now you have a rough idea how the distributed uh, system works and how the Cassandra handles data. So let me get back to graph and quickly explain how is it built on top of it. So when you split data between servers on the Cassandra layer, we need to also, also plan to sp uh, split them at the graph layer. Uh, sharding in general is not straightforward. A graph doesn't have predictable lookup since it's a highly mutable structure, so graph partitioning is even harder. With traversal querying, the only effective way to partition massive graphs is by edge cut. However, there are some problems associated with it. If you want to collocate related nodes on the one server for perf traversal performance reasons, you end up with uh, overload that server and uh, while the other servers like, remain idle. If you decide to spread the nodes evenly across the servers, the traversal becomes a very, very clunky because it has to go through between servers and the networking is slow. Practical solutions are ba based on heuristics. Each step reduces the size of the graph by collapsing the vertices and edges. So it effectively looks for group of nodes which are highly connected, but not so uh, with other groups. That creates multiple subgraphs distributed evenly. There is a problem of hot vertices with magnitude higher number of edges than the average uh, nodes. There are special cases which has to be sh uh, sharded separately using different means. Uh, mostly it's manual sharding using artificial partitioning key, but it's uh, another big topic on it. That's pretty much everything we could squeeze within the stock. Uh, there are more coming, there's loads of topic uh, to be covered on the Cassandra layer, even more on the graph. Also, the migration is it's quite a huge topic to, 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 to talk about. Uh, any questions? <laughs> we have a question. Yes, uh, we have uh, done a team effort of uh, looking into different uh, languages. We have decided um, SparkQL, uh, GraphQL, uh, Neo4j, etc. We've covered pretty much everything we could find, uh, which is 
used in the production at the moment in other companies. Uh, however, we decided for Gremlin because uh, there are multiple uh, products, multiple uh, solutions which uses Gremlin, and uh, this gave us the ability to switch between providers if we need to. Uh, we are hosting this in AWS at the moment, but we uh, keep in mind that we need to also replicate this to our customers on-prem, which we have some air-gapped customers, so we need to uh, have both worlds at the moment. Right. Any other questions? Right. Thank you.